The BBC's strategy for radio and television over the next 10 years will be the subject of the final programme of Radio 4's broadcasting tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, when George Scott's guest will be the Director General, Alistair Milne. So far, the series has looked at individual plans in local radio, network radio, television programming, and the technology that will bring us radio and television by satellite and by cable. And you're invited to put your questions to Alistair Milne about priorities, about how he sees the BBC spending its limited budget, about relations with the people and the politicians, politicians or about any other aspect of broadcasting. And the number to ring is 01-580-4411. That's 01-580-4411. The lines will be open from quarter past ten tomorrow morning and broadcasting tomorrow starts an hour later at 11.15. That's Sunday morning here on Radio 4. But now it's just after quarter past ten and time for a further exploration of one of the most horrifying experiences of the Second World War. Prisoners of the Japanese, the last of two programmes. According to the Japanese code, we um, deserve no mercy or respect at all because we had allowed ourselves to become prisoners. It was the most disgraceful thing that could ever happen to the Japanese. And so um, they didn't see why they should treat us in any special way. We had committed the ultimate offence of being taken prisoner of war. The Japanese entered the war in December 1941. Not until August 1945 were they defeated. For more than three and a half years, thousands of British servicemen endured the horrors of life as Japanese prisoners of war. Thousands of others died before the final surrender. For this two-part documentary series, David Wade has been meeting some of the men who survived and who now speak frankly of their experiences, in many cases for the first time. Part two. If I'm standing here in 10 minutes, I've made it. They took hold of me, got me to dig this big hole in front of me me uh, hut, which I took was for me grave, and they dragged me out into this circle. And they've all got coconuts with fronds on the end and the roots and the coconut there. And they start in swinging and hitting me with these coconuts. I don't remember going down. I don't remember nothing about that. It just closed in on me in the end. The recollection of a man who was the only prisoner on a tiny island where the Japanese employed him grating coconuts. The offence for which he was beaten unconscious was accidentally to have killed one of his captor's chickens. And it will serve as a reminder of what we heard in part one of this series, of the kind of treatment which, almost as a matter of routine, Japanese soldiers were capable of meeting out to their prisoners. But I do not want to dwell upon this now more than I have to. And I quote another instance, as much for the interest of its sequel, and what that has to say about one way in which the life of the Far Eastern POW was sometimes made fractionally easier. I woke up, it must have been morning, I don't know, I don't know when it was. I woke up, and I crawled towards my seat where I drew coconuts, and lifted a coconut up. I was looking at the coconut, and a Japanese soldier came out and started shouting Kura and coming, he said, are you going to smash me again with the coconut? And the sergeant, uh, the, the sergeant major, the officer, this is, at the top of the hill, told him to stop. And directly I co went one turn of the coconut, as weak as I was, almost collapsing. The, he directed the other soldiers to bring me out a banana and a third of a cigarette. And not, uh, not only that, to my surprise, in the, in the uh, evening, they'd cooked this bloody bit of chicken and they'd ma made marze mesh. I, I suppose all the Japanese prisoners of war know what it means, but it's rice and it's chicken all mixed up with it. And they brought me a meatball of this with the chicken in it and gave it to me. An act of minimum humanity, you might say in which it is also possible to see either tactlessness or a further refinement of cruelty. The victim is made to eat the flesh of the bird for whose death he has just paid so severe a penalty. But it does point to human feeling, and the same prisoner 
encountered another and more striking expression of it. I was nearly on the point of death and they'd le left me there to die. Higaki came up and he put his hand on my shoulder and he was shouting like hell at me in my face, but I could feel that he had an egg in his hand and it was on my chest. And I put my hand up under his to put my hand over the egg and he slapped me both sides across the face and walked away. And when he'd gone, then I broke the egg and sucked the inside of the egg out. Higaki's action very probably saved this man's life, and he must have known that as he did it. But observe that in order to perform an act of mercy, he plainly felt it necessary to behave in accordance with the ruling ethic of brutality. Why? You see, it's just their system. And in our city, one doesn't book the system even in this country. It, it, normally, one goes along with it. And the system demands that you treat prisoners of war as nothing less than a, a very low-grade kind of coolie and not worthy of any respect, you'll do this. But there are some people who, even in our system, who see through the current ideology, whatever it is, and apply their own standards, whatever they, whether they're right or wrong, they apply their own standards. Same with the Japanese. I can't remember names after all this period of time. It was one or two individual Japs we got on quite well with, who did try to help us, did give us some of the rations occasionally. Um, we're not all horrid and beastly. They were normal people, all in family men. And this is what, the only thing that gave us encouragement that there were some Japs who could be civilised. Much of my questioning and reading has disclosed the existence, albeit rare, of individuals, both soldiers and civilians, who could be counted on to behave with more or less covert decency, and who gave their prisoners precious hope. It is on the face of it paradoxical, in the light of their otherwise appalling reputation, that quite often these people were Koreans. But in that case, they were likely to be Christian converts, in whom another ethic held sway. However, in the Japanese too, there were areas in which their own ethic sometimes admitted of what we would recognise as humanity. I myself was never beaten up. Uh, I remember a guard coming round um, the hut one day for some reason and he just bashed everybody, but he didn't bash me. I, the only conclusion I could come to was that, uh, that I was older. My hair was white then. I, w I went grey very young in my late twenties. And uh, because one of their religions is the family, they looked on an old person as somebody who shouldn't be touched. Respect for the family also meant respect for fecundity and a twice-married soldier who was able to produce a photograph of a wife and 16 children found life much easier than many of his fellow prisoners. And then there were infrequent occasions when quite unexpectedly the anticipated savagery would evaporate and reveal a recognisable fellow being. <laughs> it was a bit of a joke really because these Japanese soldiery were little fellas and their rifle and bayonet, they always walk around with fixed bayonet, uh, sort of dwarfed them. Um, Watanabe, who, who had glasses, like these, pe like these pebble kind of glasses, that he didn't look strong enough to bloody well uh, do anything. And there was us great big hulking boots having to uh, uh, stand up and salam to him. And uh, one day, I remember one of our blokes started to laugh. And he heard it. And he went crazy. And he... Whoever he suspected, he got him out, and it was a bloke called Sergeant Winspear, and he made him kneel down, and he hit him on top of the head with all these laid-out ration tins, and uh, we thought, God, what's going to happen next? And uh, all of a sudden, he said, Ah ha ha ha! Very funny, very funny. With that, he stalked off out. But usually, such incidents did not end so happily, as we have heard brutal punishments for seemingly trivial offences and as a means of forcing work out of prisoners were the norm. And the only man I encountered who could look back on a slightly less savage regime had spent much of his time in a camp that also held some of the more senior officer POWs. So how did men tolerate this treatment? If you were beaten, how do you react? In the first place, there's the most enormous resentment that anyone can do this to you. And then there's a, um, I think it's probably a sort of some 
marvelous psychosomatic reaction or something, you become deadened. And, you know, just lie there. And uh, the pain, uh, cease to feel pain, that comes later. I haven't been wounded, but I'm told exactly the same happened with badly wounded people. You know, for the first, they're absolutely stunned and, and the nervous system cuts off and they're all right for quite a long time before it comes flooding back. But for many people, the first response to a blow is to give another in return. What then? That was really one of the most difficult things. But it was totally useless to do so. Um, and I think one sort of fairly early on got in the habit of absolutely clamping on that reaction. I mean, one or two brave and fiery people tried it early on. All that happened was they were very badly beaten up. They had to be look, carefully looked after. Um, everyone got into trouble. There was one occasion an Australian soldier, we had the strangers in our camp with us. There was Australians, Dutch and British in this camp. And uh, a Jap, in the early days, a Jap slapped his face. So he, he punched him back, knocked him to the ground. He was immediately surrounded by a half dozen guards, prodded him with bayonets. He was then severely slapped and put into a, a structure like a hot box and kept there for several days without food. He was then brought out and made to stand with a bucket of water over his head for several hours at a time, which is very gruelling, this is. And uh, threatened the next time he struck a Japanese soldier, he'd be beheaded. The threat would not have been an empty one. No wonder men clamped down on the reaction to strike back. But surely one way to avoid this awful life would have been to escape from it. In certain instances, the Japanese extracted from their prisoners a signed undertaking not to escape, but it was given under duress and held to be worthless. So what stopped these men from attempting what was, strictly speaking, their duty? You knew you couldn't escape. And we thought the fellows who tried were very foolish. There was nowhere to escape to. You couldn't get away from Java. You couldn't escape into Java because you were European. And we showed up a mile off by being Europeans. There was no boat to get on. It was a thousand miles away to Darwin. There wasn't any place to go. There wasn't any point. One morning, um, we learnt uh, that four fellows had gone. This was about uh, somewhere about the first of May, I think, 40, 42. If you could have picked four fellows to escape first and um, test the atmosphere, then these were the right four. They'd got money, uh, they got the language, they, they knew the, the customs, and those four were missing. Uh, two days later, we were working on the uh, airdrome, uh, and uh, we were called back into the camp, which was adjoining the airdrome. And uh, they lined us up, um, and they brought out these four fellows. Uh, they brought them out, and they said these were the four men who had escaped, and um, uh, they would be punished. And in future, for every man who escaped, a hundred would be shot. Now, they beat these fellows up very badly in front of us, really savage them. The next day, we were marched back on, on marched back to the flying ground, and we, instead of going to our places of work, uh, we were lined up, and we stood there for about half an hour. And then suddenly, we noticed from a camper a procession of people coming, and as it drew near, we could see that there were some guards, and then there were air force uh, fellows. Um, and then following on, there were several nips carrying picks and shovels, and then others with wreaths. They took them to the side of the flying ground, they lined them up, and they lined up a, a ten or a dozen guards, and they shot them, and an officer went along and, uh, and uh, shot them again afterwards, and uh, the men with the picks and shovels came into play, and, and uh, they were buried on the spot, just like that, in front of us. A few daring and lucky men not only made the break, but survived the almost inevitable recapture. Very few indeed regained their freedom. Escape was not a realistic alternative. Realistically, prisoners of the Japanese had no option but to muster their courage and hang on. From my own point of view, I never saw the city as I'm going to die in this bloody camp. I determined not to do so. 
But you, you began to realise that the dice are a bit loaded against you. You know, never Some people, of course, who were extremists, did literally give up. They'd, had, they'd got everything. They got leg ulcers, they got beriberi, they got dysentery and malaria. They were, they were just skeletons, literally. You, one could look at them, you look into a skeleton. The, the skull had sunk in, the, the arms were just the bones. You could see every joint of the elbow, you could see the ball and socket joint, everything. And they literally gave up. They did die. They got past the point of no return. And this happened when I was in the, in the hospital hut at um, in the camp. I lay there and said, oh my God, uh, you know, this is it. You know, I'm not going to make it. The point is that no matter how courageously determined a man might have been not to die in this bloody camp, there were so many other things that could load the dice both for and against him. And some of these were very much a matter of luck. Uh, during my periods of uh, grave digging at Tarso, it became very obvious that the uh, descriptions on the crosses showed that um, they were mostly men either below, say, 21 or 22, and over about 32. Uh, the younger ones were perhaps not mature enough to um, stand up to it mentally, and the older ones were a bit beyond it physically. You were all going to have very, very. You were all going to have dysentery. A lot of people were going to have malaria, and uh, you know everyone had scabies, and uh, they had lice. Um, and they had uh, pellagra and various complaints. Uh, what really mattered was when you had these. Now, I, I had dysentery at Marlang. I was one of the early ones. Uh, and I'd had dysentery for a month, which, which I was doing about 24 motions a, a, a day for a month uh, before I, I was allowed to be ill. And then at that time, I was in a pretty dreadful state. But I was lucky, you see, but I had that at a time when I could survive. There were times if I'd had that, you, you couldn't survive. So uh, you, were, you were all going to have these things. It really matters to when you had them. Fortunately, I say this in retrospect, I had been uh, in a children's home for four years from when I was six years old until I was 10. And from when I was 10 to 15 and a half, I was what they call boarded out with foster parents. And uh, this, for me, was a godsend, of course, when I was taken prisoner. Um, I'd had a good grounding, shall I say. And I say now, I would sooner do four years in a Jap prison camp than in that children's home. A grim echo of Evelyn Waugh's remark that anyone who has been to an English public school will always feel comparatively at home in prison. And it makes the important point that some form of advanced acclimatisation physical or mental, but preferably both, vastly increased a man's chances of pulling through. If, in the physical sense, he was already acclimatised to the Far East, he was in a much better position than all those thousands who, after months at sea, had scarcely stepped off the troop ships before they were swept up into the bag. But what else made for survival? There was, for instance, the example of other men's personal bravery. A Palestinian Jew named Oster had uh, been found getting some wood from Nip had found him and, and said he was stealing it and um, he was to be punished and the the whole camp was lined up that, uh, after we got back from working party and they said, uh, and this was a thing they were doing at that time, that everyone in the camp had got to go forward and hit this man. And the first uh, person they went forward to, or was called forward to, uh, to, to hit Oster was Ed Goodchild, the Canadian from Hamilton, Ontario. And uh, Ed went in front of, uh, of um, Oster and the Nip said, no, you hit him, see? And Goodchild said, no. And I said, go on, hit him. And Goodchild said, no. And so they hit Goodchild and, and uh, they said, no, hit him. And he said, no. And this went on until they, they hit him with rifle butts and and all the guards went in and they kicked him and knocked him about, but he still refused to strike Ulster. And eventually, of course, he was in a, in a sit, in circumstances he couldn't strike anyway. He was he was uh, unconscious and not 
completely out. Um, and then the, the camp commandant, uh, the Japanese commandant that is, who had been watching this from the guard room, he came on the scene and he realised that they were going to lose face because if they couldn't get that first man to strike him, they weren't going to get the second. No one could could to follow up and, and uh, undo what Ed Goodchild had done. And he had enough sense to to stop it, realising that they were on a loser. Well, um, Ed Goodchild never got over that beating. He actually uh, died uh, later on on the boat that uh, uh, we were going back to uh, Java in. Such dramatic instances could have this very practical effect that they put a break, if only a very small one, on what the Japanese could get away with. Over and above that, men took heart from them. But it was also possible to find encouragement in the much more mundane circumstances of daily life. They were an inspiration, the officers, no question at all. They were rag ragged like us, they were bearded, they were lousy like us. When you stood in, in, uh, in line for your bowl of rice, and you looked around and you saw a captain or a major standing with his bowl behind you, had done a hell of a lot for morale. Not that we wanted to see them degraded like that, but we thought if they can stand it, so can we. To keep the record straight, it should in parenthesis be said that not all men found their officers an inspiration. The whole structure of respect had broken down when Singapore fell. And there was no good rapport, in my opinion, between the officers and men. It, was, it didn't get much better throughout the whole time. It was patchy, but it wasn't good, ever. Why should this have been? A number of reasons have been put to me. Men blamed their officers for their defeat. Officers were sometimes treated better, sometimes did less arduous work, or none at all. But the likelihood is that it depended primarily on the chemistry and circumstances of each group, and such variation is exactly what you would expect. As one of the last speakers put it, the feeling that we too can take it did one hell of a lot for morale. And so did the knowledge that no matter how much your captors held the whip hand, it was still possible to put one over them. It was a running battle for the years we were in uh, Yokohama, uh, beating the Japs to it. We did quite well on the whole, but they found all the hiding places we had except for the rice buckets, which had about an inch gap. We made a false bottom for it and that, and they never looked under there. So, you know, we, we had the jab beat all the time. When we were working on a, on a cutting as opposed to an embankment, we had to dig the stumps out. And um, the thing to do there was to uh, get out and select a fairly reasonable stump in the morning and uh, dig it out. And when the next lot of guards came up, you carried it grunting off to the side of the railway. And uh, when they disappeared, you brought it back and reinserted it in its hole. Um, they were usually different lots of guards. Uh, they got relieved from time to time. And you could go on doing this all day as they passed up. Passed up. We put um, carborundum paste into the oil sumps of the dynamos and the van engines. When we were putting the steam pipes up, we put lots of nuts and bolts inside. So we hoped that then, when the engines were running, the nuts and bolts would do a lot of good. And we used to, when they rigged up their lights for night work, we used to drop nuts, nuts from the top deck onto these, you know, and the. Um, the hammers that were used by the, uh, the platers we used to spot well to the deck and as they came in on they, they tried to pick them on, couldn't understand it. And we used to drop the plates on hose pipes, water hoses and air hoses. So I had the Japanese recognise that, that the fact that they were, were being sabotaged, that we were being executed. But they were so slovenly in their workmanship that they accepted this as their own bad workmanship. Apparently the Japan of the early 1940s was not the byword for industrial efficiency we know today. Indeed, standards were often abysmal in the matter of design, workmanship and safety. Prisoners then could maintain their own morale by pursuing this running battle with the enemy, and sometimes the enemy, by unwittingly introducing an element of black farce, would do the job for them. One example was the commandant of a camp in Korea. He would make the most fantastic 
fantastic speeches. They would go on and on and on. And we were all lined up to listen to this. And uh, the longer he went on, uh, the worse he got and got carried completely away and got completely removed, utterly removed from the scene altogether. And he was just standing up there, uh, just yelling away at the top of his uh, voice. And um, the, then uh, he'd suddenly remember that he was addressing us. And he'd turn round and he'd hit the interpreter, Tokyo Pete, under the hero, and say, well, you know, tell him what I've just said. And Pete would then sort of say uh, in his very, very restricted English, he say all prisoners be very careful. He say you understand. And uh, the commandant would look at him and think, well, you know, uh, I wonder if he's right. Uh, I've been carrying on for about 20 minutes, and, 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 and that must be a peculiar language, English, if that's all he's got to say. The farce, such as it was, became even blacker with this same commandant's attempts to introduce a bit of high culture. He one morning came into the barrack room and set up a blackboard and uh, everything and said, uh, uh, all prisoners will now uh, learn uh, Japanese, um, I think it was no poems or something, I think they call them no poems. And so uh, he started off, Chisai uh, ki no me wa, and he sat in front of this board. We hadn't had breakfast. This was about six o'clock in the morning. Uh, he brought somebody in to teach us Ikebana, the Japanese flower arrangements. And uh, here we were with people dying from starvation and uh, all this uh, Japanese culture being pushed down our throats. Although the Japanese had no intention of entertaining their captives, entertainment was a necessity. Even on the dreadful Burma Siam Railway, every tenth day was normally free, and men there organised impromptu concerts. Bridge fiends found time for interminable rubbers, avid readers devoured the few available books, prisoners lectured to one another and published camp magazines. One man in Sumatra ran a cigarette-making business. This was all part of not giving up, and it leads on to more personal strategies for survival, which, indeed, may well have been the most important of all, though some of these were quite remarkably matter-of-fact, like the possession of one small, empty jar of Marmite. I worshipped that jar because that kept my one razor blade sharp by honing it on that jar, and I could keep my personal appearance, keep my pride up. One did become fairly adept, at least at avoiding some situations. One knew um, what would upset them. Um, I grew a large beard and uh, slightly above average height, and both these two things seemed to annoy the Japanese a great deal, so I had to sort of keep... I soon got pretty clever at getting into the back rank of any formation. One of the doctors warned us against the mind atrophying, I think is the actual proper word for this. And I set my mind to devising a sort of um, a model bus system in a town. I could start off in the morning where I'd left off the day before, devising a system of channels suspended on wires. Uh, an anvil from the roof of the bus would engage in a particular channel and turn it left and turn it right. I had a most marvellous system worked out completely. One went off into one, the world of one's own. Well, I think you try to adopt a mental attitude. It's not happening to me. You try to create um, a wall, and you try to obliterate all the, the, the bitter side and the, the, the inhumanity and the brutality, and uh, hope that you won't be the next chap to be beaten up and killed. We cultivated a, a prisoner of war mind. You, you've got to live today um, and to worry too much about uh, next year or next month or the year after uh, it wasn't on, you know, the, the, it was too black. So you, you concentrated uh, on what you were doing that day. I know um, I used to, in these uh, nasty moments when uh, there was uh, what we call a panic on and people being knocked around things happening, uh, I used to say to myself, um, 
no, if I'm still here tomorrow, I've made it, you see. Uh, and in some critical uh, moments, I, 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 I'm afraid I, I got down to saying probably, if I'm standing here in ten minutes, I've made it. I'm a bit embarrassed to say it, I believe in the power of, of thought, or prayer, if you like. I think positive thinking, if you would, there is a power in the brain which we haven't tapped yet fully. And um, I also had uh, malaria, SD malaria, which is uh, a very bad malaria that goes to the brain and causes insanity and death. But I used to talk to myself at night as if I was talking to someone in my brain every night for about an hour, talking to myself, telling myself to get well. And it seemed to work. Um, I have heard stories of the same thing from other prisoners, ex-prisoners. One thing that contributed to survival was the fact that, as we heard at the start of the first programme, men became accustomed even to these conditions and to an extent accepted them. And this acceptance was no doubt made easier by the way in which, as also happened to prisoners in Germany, home became a distant memory and interest in women died away. In the end, of course, there was one survival factor which inevitably began to dominate all the rest. In the last three or four months of the uh, experience when we were living in another camp, which we called a jungle camp, um, death was common. Uh, I think we lost about uh, 360 people in the last three months. And it was a daily business uh, uh, dealing with the death. And one began to realize that if the war went on much longer, there wouldn't be many of us who would survive. The question was, how much longer could they hold out? How much longer would the war go on? Most prisoners had no clear idea of how the fighting was going. In some camps, there were radios constructed and concealed with amazing ingenuity and at appalling risk, for which reason real news could only be disseminated with the greatest caution. Elsewhere, men gleaned what they could, reading between the lines of smuggled Japanese newspapers, observing their captors' deteriorating morale, and noting how the food grew less and worse than ever. Rare letters from home, heavily censored, and at times limited to cards of only 25 words, did little to enlighten them. Indeed, as they looked toward the autumn of 1945, the best these men could anticipate was an invasion sure to be fiercely contested of every inch of Japanese-held territory. And if that happened, then, even if they didn't die of hunger and disease, their chances may well have seemed, for other reasons, rather slim. I know now, for a fact, that um, if the four American forces had landed on Japan, the island itself, we were to be put down, so all prisoners of war would be put down immediately. I'm pretty certain that in certain circumstances, they would have turned machine guns on us. I personally believe that the atom bomb saved us because it provided the way to, for the Japs to get out without a loss of face. How far the dropping of the two atomic bombs did significantly shorten the war is a matter of dispute. Certainly, within a week of the bombing of Nagasaki, hostilities were at an end. But some maintain they would have ended very quickly anyway. The Japanese government, though not, it should be said, the army, had been seeking terms of peace some days before August the 6th, when the first bomb wiped out Hiroshima. But even after that, the military remained defiant, and three days later, there had still been no surrender. In the Nagasaki shipyards, on the morning of August the 9th, the prisoners were, as usual, at work. It was a beautiful day and uh, not a cloud in the sky as far as I could see. And then suddenly I heard a slight murmur and I looked up and I saw a silver pinpoint. And I thought, you lucky guys, just a matter of thousands of feet between captivity and freedom. And started sweeping again. And then I heard a click. And the next thing was a blinding flash, so vivid and tinged with blue uh, I thought, I said, uh, curiously, at that time, I was thinking, wreck it's blue. Uh, what's connecting with blue and white? You know, that sort of thing across your mind. 
And then there's this terrific explosion, like a million Niagara's. And uh, I dropped to the ground right away, and, and the dust and bits of straw and paper were drawn up into a huge column. And uh, on each side of me, all around, was this violent flame, yellow and orange. And as it went up, the column on each side, when I dared look up, was tinged with this orange and yellow flame. And I cowered down again, and uh, I waited for the next one to come, because I thought, well, the next one would be the end of the world. It was so terrific. And then I heard the sound of feet running. And when I looked up, I saw our fellows running down the road. So I joined up with these men. We had a, a subway. It ran under the road, and a high tide the water seeped through, and they were all waist deep in water. But no one complained about the water that day. We got inside, and the guards shut the door on each end, a steel door with holes perforated. And uh, we stayed in there for some time, and then we were told to come out. And everything was a standstill. The, the place was in ruins. The, the top of the dock, the roof of the dock, it looked as if a giant had got a pair of giant shears and ripped it up. And uh, we were sent back to the camp. And the camp was a further mile and a half further along. And the blast had reached into that, had blown out the windows and bulged the end of the building, which only a lath and plaster affair, bulged that out like a balloon. And uh, as we were walking back to the camp, we weren't allowed to look back, but I, I'd managed to get a look at it. The, uh, this huge column of black smoke, with tinted with flame on each side, had opened up on, on top, and opened up like a huge mushroom, and tentacles were hanging down. Next day, we went, we went down to work, and as we were going through the gates, we saw, now this really rent me, I, I could break my heart, there were young children brought back from Nagasaki. And these, these children never burnt. Their skin was hanging off in shreds. And of course, their parents were much the same. But these innocent little babies, I, I, I could near to tears now when I think about it. And uh, they were so openly hostile to us, those men, bringing their wives and children, that they would attack us if the army hadn't been there. But I, I shall never forget that. There's, one of the worst experiences I've ever had. I think I was the most, what did I say, most appalling memory I have of that, that time in Japan. Decisive though the bombings were, such reports of them as reached prisoners elsewhere were both muffled and delayed. We might add that uh, the city had been blasted off the face of the earth, there was nothing left of it. So we wondered what it was. And then the second time it happened, and uh, uh, we knew something really had happened there. And then we saw them all listening round the wireless and we heard the Emperor speaking, because we'd listened to the Japanese wireless and the Emperor often gave the speeches. And um, we saw them listening intently. And of course, a couple of the, the ex-army chap we knew, they just said to us, sense our worry, what was finished? And that was that. But we were still in charge of the chap guards, even after that, for a small length, short length of time. And then one day, it must have been about a week after, all the chaps cashed in their rifles, about a heap of them were away, that's the last we ever saw them. We did not actually know for quite, a, I suppose, at least 40 days or so. We thought it was over, we thought we knew, on the very day that it was because, again, these not unfriendly um, Japanese farmers murmured things. And uh, we came back to the camp that evening, uh, quite convinced that it was over. Uh, and then um, oh, so the doubts arose. The Japanese refused to say anything. And um, we thought, I think there was one day, when we feared that it wasn't over. But uh, then we woke up one morning and found all the Japanese had gone. Such agonising uncertainties frequently arose while the commanders, both national and local, tried to reconcile the duty of obedience to the Emperor with that of fighting to the last man. But this sudden, faltering end to the ordeal seems to have been fairly typical. That the guards made off 
suggests an answer to the question, did they know that their treatment of their prisoners had been by any humane standards intolerable? It suggests they did. On the other hand, some guards stayed where they were and adjusted their behaviour almost overnight to the fact that yesterday's despicable captives were now their conquerors. To one such group, the arrival at their camp of a heavily armed party of Gurkhas must have come as a distinct surprise. A Havildar, a sergeant, in charge of this party, just, he was horror-stricken at uh, the appearance we were in. Where are the Japanese? They were his first words to us, where are the Japanese? Well, we gladly took them to the Japanese, first to the guards who sat just inside the camp gate. Out came the cookeries, and they went in with the cookery, beheaded the guard. They asked us for more Japanese, well, we directed them to where more Japanese could be found. And there was quite a slaughter going on. And then a British officer arrived at the next party and stopped that carnage. Um, he said, we, we don't do things, in true British style, we don't do it quite this way. And with that, those men knew that in spirit, if not yet in body, they were already home. Indeed, over the next few months, most of them came home in body too. The transition from those three and a half dreadful years to post-war Britain seems to have been made with varying degrees of ease or difficulty and is another story on its own. Certainly, there is no space to tell it here. But all the men I spoke to have survived in at least reasonable health the 40 years or so since then, though many still bear the physical marks of their experience, most commonly the ineradicable scars of huge tropical ulcers. But within themselves, invisibly, what other sorts of marks do they still bear? My hatred is still alive. Uh, one of my friends explained his feelings, and I think it reflects mine equally well. He said, if I saw a Japanese on fire now, Andy, he said I wouldn't spit on him. Knowing of the inhuman treatment that we received at the hands of the Japanese, my regret is that they only dropped two atom bombs. Had it been my way, I would have dropped one on every Japanese city, town, village, wiped them out as a nation. I think I'm wrong, and I, I think I ought to forget. I, I ought to be able to forget, but I can't. And uh, I'm afraid that I, I still dislike the Japanese. It's, I, I, I realize that there's some fault in uh, probably saying this, but um, I, I just can't forgive them, and um, I, I can't get it out of my system. It's as simple as that. For many years, I would have nothing to do with any Japanese, of course, and as time has gone by, many things in this country, you've got to buy Japanese. You've got no choice. If you want something, it's got to be Japanese. This always bothered me, and then four or five years ago, into Liz's library where she works in Weymouth, came a Japanese. And when I came in to fetch her, um, she said, there's a Japanese in the corner over there. And now I thought, well, Here's the chance for me to lay any ghost if I've got any. This young man, he's got no connection with the war. He's born since the war, obviously. Can I talk to him as a person and not look at him as a possible chap for a, a good swift dig in the river to get my own back? And I talked to him, and over the succeeding few weeks, we invited him and two of his friends who were here in Weymouth on a language course. And they came to my house, we had a meal, they provided the Japanese meal, and I found I could. I'd laid the ghost. I could talk to Japanese. In a curious way, um, I think during that period, I did build up a little energy. It really made me terribly keen when I got out to forget it all and to get on and try and make a career. It certainly, um, I wasted no time, never wasted any time in, in grumbling about things I can't do anything about or feeling resentful about unfairness or anything like that. Um, you know, I, just, I think it taught me that um, you have to take life as it comes and make the best of it and, and get on with it. After all, they were doing what their code told them to do. And um, if you consider every nation has a seeds in itself, when you consider the trust is committed and the Korean and Vietnamese war. 
Um, I think we're all capable of doing something like that. Not quite as bad, perhaps, but there were dreadful things done anyway. And so I, I feel no bitterness, and there's no point in being bitter anymore. It's another generation. Prisoners of the Japanese was compiled and presented by David Wade. And the former prisoners whose voices you heard were Edward Anderson, Clifford Bailey, Edward Beatty, Alan Bolter, Frank Brewer, Sir John Brown, Fred Chandler, Frank Doherty, John Gregory, Jim Hodson, Chip Lochlin, Riven Monteith, Harold Payne, Ivor Thomas, John Whitehead and Alan Wood. The producer was Alan Haydock. And there's another chance to hear tonight's programme on Friday morning at three minutes past eleven. And there's an article in the current issue of The Listener by David Wade about that programme. This is Radio 4. It's eleven o'clock and time for Light in Our Darkness, presented by Hugh Fopel. There are few things which I could say have changed my attitude to the world. I can remember individuals who have impressed me with their insights, whose own lives have forced me to rethink the way I live and the values that I have. But by far the most dramatic influence was a book, The Prophet, by Khalil Gibran. I was first introduced to Gibran's work ten years ago when I was studying for the ministry. I'd arrived at college thinking I had all the answers, believing I knew what faith and prayer were all about. Reading The Prophet introduced me to the mystical element in life, an element that, as a young Christian, I tended to view as romantic and not terribly useful. Christianity, to me, was all about action, about doing things and meeting people, not about being quiet or meditating. That was far too passive. Khalil Gibran's book changed most of that. Khalil Gibran was born 100 years ago this month, on January the 6th, 1883, the Feast of the Epiphany, the great feast celebrating the manifestation of the Lord to the world and a manifestation which Gibran himself captures in his writings. He was a Lebanese poet and a painter, who, although he was an American citizen, is considered to be one of the greatest poets of the Arab-speaking world. He began by writing exclusively in Arabic, and only wrote in English after he'd permanently settled in America. His best-known book is The Prophet. At the beginning of the book, the prophet, al-Mustafa, is about to leave the fictional city of Orpha Lazy to return to the land of his birth. He's a great seer and possesses a profound knowledge of the infinite. Before he leaves, the people of the city ask the prophet to tell them of his knowledge. Then said a rich man, speak to us of giving. And he answered, You give but little when you give of your possessions. It is when you give of yourself that you truly give. And there are those who have little and give it all. These are the believers in life and the bounty of life, and their coffer is never empty. There are those who give with joy, and that joy is their reward. And there are those who give with pain, and that pain is their baptism. And there are those who give and know not pain in giving, nor do they seek joy, nor give with mindfulness of virtue. They give as, in yonder valley, the myrtle breathes its fragrance into space. Through the hands of such as these, God speaks, and from behind their eyes, he smiles upon the earth. Gibran was born in Lebanon, in the village of Bashiri, near the famous cedars of Lebanon, so often mentioned in the Old Testament, and used by Solomon to build his temple. Gibran's parents were Maronites, Christians of an Eastern Rite, obedient to the Pope, but with a Syriac liturgy and a married clergy. Indeed, Gibran's maternal grandfather was a Maronite bishop. Gibran himself was baptised a Christian, but seems to have spent most of his adult life apart from organised religion. He found it too dogmatic, too stifling for his somewhat freer spirit. He was, nonetheless, a very religious man. Life was not easy for the young Khalil, his father spent most of his income as a farmer on drinking. Food was scarce, and Khalil and his brother and two sisters grew up against a background of distressing poverty and in an atmosphere charged with tension and bitterness between a drunken father and a despairing mother. Not surprisingly, Gibran craved solitude and often sat alone in a cave sketching, something his father would beat him for at home. Matters came to a head in 1894 when, at the age of 11, Gibran's mother took the family to live in America. 
But three years later, young Khalil was back in Beirut to finish his studies. And then he went to Paris to study painting. It's from Paris that he wrote Spirits Rebellious, a poem which called on the youth of Lebanon to remember their heritage and culture. It wasn't particularly seditious, but the rulers of Lebanon, under Turkish rule at the time, felt it was dangerous enough to exile Gibran and have him excommunicated from his church. Gradually, however, Gibran's poems and paintings began to attract attention, and in Paris he studied painting under the famous French sculptor Auguste Rodin, who is supposed to have likened Gibran's work to that of William Blake. From Paris, Khalil returned to America, where he lived until his death in 1931, at the early age of 48. It was in America that he met Mary Haskell, a teacher who nurtured his talent and encouraged him to write in English. And although they were totally devoted to each other, Mary more than once refused his offer of marriage, on the grounds that Gibran's somewhat more independent spirit needed to be free of such ties. Nevertheless, they remained close until Gibran's death, and it is from their correspondence, which only came to light after Mary's death in 1964, that we learn so much more about Gibran. We see a man who possessed an amazing insight into the spiritual world. He was constantly searching for that sacred spirit which is such a vital part of all his writings. He expressed his insights in poetry and in painting. And it's easy to see why. Both mediums never deal with facts or dogmas. They draw people to something beyond themselves. They conjure up images, convey moods, describe feelings. And Gibran's poetry breaks out of the very words it's expressed in. For Gibran, the poet's great gift is to discover miracles in nature and the commonplace, to see beauty in the moment that seems to be fleeting, but is in truth everlasting. In conversation with Mary, Gibran described his view of the poet's role. Poets ought to listen to the rhythm of the sea, that's the rhythm in Job and in all the magnificent parts of the Old Testament. You hear it in that double way of saying a thing that the Hebrews used. It's said, and then said right off again, a little differently. And that's like the waves of the sea. You know how a big wave rolls in and carries the big pebbles with it in a crashing noise? Then some of the pebbles roll back again with a smaller noise, a sort of undercurrent of sound. And then a second wave will roll up smaller than the first. And then there's a pause, and soon another big wave will come, and the same thing happens all over again. That's the music to learn from, and the music of the wind, and the rustle of leaves. Gibran succeeded in using poetry to convey the most complex of mystical ideas in a simple, understandable way. He managed to put into words images of the infinite. Gibran's poetry captures the very heart of the Christian faith, for it talks about relationships, between people, of course, but more fundamental than that, about an individual's relationship with the very ground of his being, with the infinite, which for Gibran and all Christians becomes concrete and real in a relationship with a man, Jesus of Nazareth. In his book, Jesus the Son of Man, Gibran presents Jesus of Nazareth through the eyes of people who knew him, some fictional, some actual, and so we have Mary Magdalene on meeting Jesus for the first time, Anna, the mother of Mary, on the birth of Jesus, Zacchaeus on the fate of Jesus, and Barabbas on the last words of Jesus, and many others, nearly 80 people who Gibran uses to reflect on Jesus. In one very poignant poem, John, the beloved disciple, reflects in his old age. <laughs> You would have me speak of Jesus, but how can I lure the passion song of the world into a hollowed reed? In every aspect of the day, Jesus was aware of the Father. He beheld him in the clouds and in the shadows of the clouds that pass over the earth. He saw the Father's face reflected in the quiet pools and the faint print of his feet upon the sand, and he often closed his eyes to gaze into the holy eyes. We are all sons and daughters of the Most High, but the Anointed One was his firstborn, who dwelt in the body of Jesus of Nazareth, and he walked among us, and we beheld him. And for Gibran, that person of Jesus was real. He saw him in his dreams and experienced him in his life. 
In a letter to Mary Haskell, he wrote, My heart is full today, full of strange, calm, serene shadows. I saw Jesus in my dream last night. The same warm face, the large, dark eyes burning peacefully, the dusty feet, the rustic, grey-brown garment, the long, curvy staff, and the same old spirit, the spirit of one who does nothing but gaze quietly, sweetly at life. Oh, Mary, why can't I see him in my dreams every night? Why can't I gaze at life half as calmly as he does? In the last ten years of his life, Gibran was dogged with ill health, and he was acutely aware of human frailty, not least his own. But in his poetry he rejoiced in the beauty and majesty of a holy God, and the essential simplicity of a gospel which presented Jesus in his strength, reaching out a hand to man in all his need and frailty. In New York, at the turn of the new year of 1924, just as the bells heralded the arrival of the year, he remarked to Mary, Jesus still lives. Through 2,000 years and from 8,000 miles, Jesus still lives. You can sense that conviction throughout all Gibran's works. And reading through his 18 or so books, you can watch that conviction mature. In his earlier books, he ignores the world and tends to speed towards eternity. He sees the world as a place where misfortune must purify the soul for its eventual reunion with God. Then the increasing warmth of life leads him to be less dualistic. The material world becomes illuminated with heavenly light. He sees meaning in people's faces and joy in the sound of children playing. At the end, Gibran discovers and acknowledges that humanity is the spirit of divineness on earth. Eternity begins to shine on earth. And at the heart of that is the person of Jesus. Upon one night, nay, an hour, an instant separated from the ages, for it was stronger than the ages, the lips of the Spirit were opened, and they sent forth the word of life, which was in the beginning with the Spirit. And it descends with the light of the stars and the rays of the moon, and took form, and was a child in the arms of a woman. And it was in a humble place, where shepherds guarded their flocks from the perils of the night. It was a child that slept upon dry straw in a manger, a sovereign who sat upon a throne fashioned of hearts heavy with the weight of bondage and souls hungry for the spirit and thoughts thirsting for wisdom. A suckling child it was, swaddled in his mother's garments, who rested with his gentleness the scepter of power from the hands of Jupiter and delivered it unto the poor shepherd resting on the earth with his flock. He it was who took wisdom from Minerva and put it on the tongue of the lowly fisherman sitting in his craft by the shores of the lake. And upon a night, nay, an hour, an instant discarded from the years of my life, for it was fairer than all the years of my life, the Spirit descended upon me from the circle of light on high and looked upon me with your eyes and spoke to me with your tongue. From that look and that word sprang love and it found rest in my broken heart. A mighty love it was, seated in the manger within my breast, a beautiful love, swaddled in clothes of kindness, a gentle suckling lying upon the breast of the spirit, turning my grief into joy and my wretchedness to glory and making my aloneness a pleasant thing. The night has been long, my beloved, and now dawn is nigh. Soon shall it be day, for the breath of the child Jesus has filled the firmament and is merged with the air. My life was a tale of woe. Now it has become a joyful thing, and it will be turned to bliss, for the arms of the child have enfolded my heart and embraced my soul. Light in Our Darkness, a portrait of Khalil Gibran, was presented by Hugh Furpel. The reader was Timothy Bateson. 
And tomorrow night at 11 o'clock, Timothy Dudley Smith, the Bishop of Thetford, who is the author of over a hundred modern hymns, will be talking to David Winter about the art of hymn writing and the beliefs and concerns that shape his approach to it. That's in Tell Out My Soul at 11 o'clock tomorrow night. But now at quarter past...